all those relationships that people have built up working together, well, when someone leaves, like that's all that experience is, is gone. So the more you can kind of keep people together, the more efficiently everybody is. And, yeah. and so, um, it, it's just, it is a thing that's good for the company. And so very intentionally, we try and take the position of we'll risk when we do a, a venture, when we kind of say, okay, we're going to create a new game, we'll risk money on it, but we try never to risk jobs on, on a game. And it's, it's a choice that we've made. Welcome to the Breakthrough Podcast. I am your host, David Mansella. As you guys know by now, uh, this venue is to honor the people that are making this world a better place by leading exceptional organizations. And today we have with us Jesse, one of those amazing leaders that I found uh, by, you know, going and look for the very, very uh, exceptional people that I can find on, on in North America specifically. So Jesse, welcome to the show. Glad to be here, David. Uh, Jesse, for your aud for the audience, uh, can you tell me your full name? Uh, where do you live, and what do you do for a living? Yeah, so I'm uh, Jesse Shell. I live in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I run a video game studio called Shell Games, and I also teach at Carnegie Mellon University. That's beautiful. So, for the audience, and also maybe maybe also for yourself, if you go to every traditional podcast. They have a long list of achievements for the people that they're interviewing and they do this and that. And I've been interviewed several times by other podcasters and I'm like, that doesn't sound right. I just rather speak about your achievements and, and open your heart and get the lessons out of you. Because it's not about bragging, it's about the truth that set you free and gave you the success that you had, right? Makes sense. <laughs> All right. One of the exciting things for me is to interview somebody that was able to make a beautiful company through video game development. And I tell you what, um, back in 2010, 2009, 2010, I was approached by a huge company to write up a, a video game. So my main business is ISU Corp and we build applications for customers. I, we have never done video game applications before in our life. And these guys had been developing this game for two years, spent over $10 million, and the game was 10% done, and they were 90% spending their budget. So they had to fix something. So they called us, we were honest, and like, listen, we do business app, we do engineering apps, we do apps that connect to satellites too. Like, we do very low level stuff, but we never done video games before. But we know how to build apps. So I went in, and little did I know it was going to be the most difficult project I have ever worked in my life. <laughs> it was successful and we saved the project. We actually released the, 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 the game in two years later with 200 developers. It was a big, big effort. By boy, did I learn a lot, a lot about uh, different personality types in the game world, different culture types, like even even within like you know the, the you know the right remember the 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 artists the 3d artists the modelers the level engineers the backend developers nobody talked to each other it was a mess so what i did to make this game successful is i made everybody friends first i opened the lines of communication and i stopped the blaming game you That's know it. but it was hard man like it was I think I lost most of my hair during those two years. <laughs> <laughs> and you do this for a living, Jesse. So tell me, how did you get into game development? So uh, uh, creating games has always been something always interesting to me. Uh, my whole life, I've always been interested in anything that seemed magical. And um, games in general, even just like a board game, the idea that we're going to come up with some rules and have little pieces of cardboard and suddenly we're all getting very emotional about what's happening. Was, even, even just simple games have a kind of a magic. And then you look at the magic of technology where the technology could do things you didn't think could do before and you bring those together and it, there's just so much opportunity to create exciting new kinds of human experience. And so I've always been interested. I started making video games when I was maybe 12 years old and um, I, 
I kind of had multiple paths. I started out, I was, uh, I was a circus performer, but I was also, um, uh, focusing on like computer science because I'm like I'm never gonna real make have a real career in the circus I don't think it's really gonna work and then I was able to bring it all together by finding ways to kind of use the technology in order to create entertainment experiences you know at places like Disney and other places um, and and so you know most most of my career has been how do you use these new technologies to create experiences nobody has ever had before hmm. That's wonderful. Jesse, you were 12 years old and you were writing games already? That's incredible. <laughs> it, you know, it was it was something I was interested in and passionate about, and it was kind of a special time. The early 80s, computers were coming into the house, and anybody who sold a computer was trying to teach people how to program because yeah. it, it that was you know nobody was quite sure how we were going to interface with computers so there was a lot of sudden resources available hey if you want to learn to program we're going to teach you the basics and it was all right there and so i just i really was just in the right place in the right time to be able to embrace it and uh, and and learn a lot from it and you're actually right jesse i i was blessed too like i was a teenager in the 80s and um i remember when when i first got introduced to my first computer it was a commodore 64. yeah but that thing had a graphics card already, and we, we, we were writing code with the logo. I don't know if you remember that, yeah, that programming logo. language, yeah. right? And, I'm, and I remember, like, I could actually make it speak, <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, very primitive, but you're right. There was very little as far as software titles uh, because it was brand new technology. So you really needed to know a bit of programming if you wanted to take advantage of the computer back then, right? Yeah, no, I mean, it was there, you know, when you when you turned on computers back then, they popped up a little prompt that wanted you to start typing code. That's like what it was. Nowadays, if you want to write code, you got to go, you got to push past all this stuff to be able to write code. In the old days, it was like, okay, go start writing code right now. And if you want to do other things, you had to kind of, you had to kind of push past. But so, it, you know, that was, that was, a, it was an exciting time. Um, and it's been really exciting to just be able to watch the evolution of those technologies uh, you know, over the years to where we are now. I remember when I was in high school, um, um, I just fell in love with computer science and my buddies, like in the summertime, we would actually just play video games on our, on our computers. And I remember it was called the Summer Games, actually where it was the first version of uh, games like actually represented actual games like BMX games, like, you know, jumping on bicycles and stuff yeah. in this primitive graphics, but we had a blast. <laughs> yeah, that was a great one as summer games by Epix. I definitely remember that. That was a, uh, that was, those were some really well-designed uh, uh, games. I mean, it was, that's, that's part of what always, again, back to that whole notion of magic that you don't need massively powerful technology to create engaging experiences that was part of what was so exciting back then the technology was very primitive but people who understood like the nature of human psychology and interaction could make really powerful experiences using simple technologies and it's you know and it's the same thing today you can throw all the you know all the all the computer cycles you want at at a problem but if you don't if you don't if you're not if the technology isn't well interleaved with the psychology you're not going anywhere you you've got to have that marriage of where does this where does the technology and the psychology come together to create a human experience you know you're so right i remember um in the 90s i just graduated computer science and I was able to put together a token ring network. Remember, this is before TCP IP. Oh, and I, I, put, I remember, oh, yeah. Right? I put four pieces together and I got I got this first multiplayer game installed. And I when I started playing this thing, and I, I, I got my nephews with me and they all grabbed our computer terminal and we could see each other's characters on the same game. I was like, my mind blew up. I was like, this is crazy, amazing. Wow. <laughs> we, couldn't, we couldn't stop playing that game. It's funny because right after that, I actually got real job as a developer and the whole game thing for me went away, like the desire of playing games. My nephews are still game addicts, you know? <laughs> <laughs> 
but um, it's beautiful. Uh, tell me, did you decide to go to university with the mindset that you were going to write games for a living or, or what did you do? No, that didn't, that wasn't something that seemed realistic to me at all. I mean, as much as I was fascinated by uh, video games and as much as I created them um, as a hobby, I grew up in the Northeast and um, uh, the idea of a career in computer science, that seemed realistic. There were computer companies around and software companies, but video game companies, that was a thing that was like far away in California that I didn't know anybody who did that. I didn't know anybody who knew anybody who did that. It just didn't seem like a realistic path as much as it was an appealing idea. I, I, I didn't even see a gateway to it. And then even going to, you know, I went, I did my undergraduate at Rensselaer. Um, you know, the whole time going to Rensselaer, I never met anybody or heard about any alums who were in the game industry. It just even even in like this professional computer science educational context, I saw no pathway to the game industry. Um, and so I, I didn't even really take it, think about it in a serious way. It wasn't until I was in graduate school at Carnegie Mellon where I saw some opportunities to work on virtual reality that I started to kind of open a window to something like that. So you, you actually, so you had a computer science degree and you kept going then or how was your uh, college education? Yeah, so my path was this way. I went for a computer science degree at Rensselaer and then I decided I should, I probably need to get a job. I wanted to go to grad school, but I didn't understand how I could afford grad school. So in my job interviews, I would always ask, you don't pay for grad school, do you? You know, because I, if you do, I'd be very interested. And most of the companies said, are you crazy? No, of course we don't pay for graduate school. But one company, which was uh, Bell Communications Research, um, they said, well, we used to do that, but we don't do that anymore. Um, and then he kind of paused and he's like, well, we have this one program. It's a program in computer networking um, it's, you know, it's called, we call it information networking. And sometimes we send people to graduate school for that. And if you're interested, I can put you on the list. And so he puts me on the list and it turns out somebody wants to hire me at Bell Communications Research. And part of it is they will be able to send me for a master's degree at Carnegie Mellon to learn more about computer networking. And they're like, do you want to do that? And I thought computer networking, no, like that sounds so boring because this was the early nineties. There was no web yet. Right. And so what am I going to do with computer networking? It just didn't seem interesting to me. And I went away to think about it. I went, I was, remember playing a game of pinball because I always like playing pinball. And I was thinking, yeah, I don't want to do that. Computer networking is so boring. And, and I thought, well, then what do I want to do? And I'm like, oh, you know what I'd love? I'd love to be able to make things like this pinball machine because this thing's really cool. And, and then I started thinking, okay, well, if I was gonna make a pinball machine, what would I do? Well, I'd bake a bunch of sensors and I'd have to connect them with wires and they have to send messages and oh my God, it's computer networking. And I realized like, oh, okay. I'm, I was thinking of computer networking the wrong way. And so I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do this. So I went to work at Bell Communications Research. They sent me to Carnegie Mellon and the focus of my master's thesis there was networked virtual reality because um, there was a, a small virtual reality lab but they didn't know much about networking and so i was like okay i'm learning all about networking i'll bring networking and virtual reality together and so that ended up being my graduate school work and then that ultimately led to a job at the disney virtual reality studio um, in the mid 90s and that was really my entry into the professional video game world was kind of coming in through this sort of high tech pathway, going kind of virtual reality, and then going to Disney, doing virtual reality there. Um, that, so that was really there was cool. already the notion of virtual reality back in the nineties. So virtual reality was first conceived and the first prototypes were built in the late 1960s. Um, wow. Yeah. And, and so then there were kind of crude prototypes in the seventies and crude prototypes in the eighties, but in the nineties, um, it started to come to market. They started making and selling virtual reality systems. They were high-end systems. They weren't, they kind of weren't for the home, but they were for, uh, you know, enterprise and industrial applications for the most part. Although there were experiments with kind of putting them in arcades and things. And so there was this sort of 
burst of energy around virtual reality in the early 90s. And uh, Disney got kind of looked at it and said, wow, this could be the future of the theme park. So they got aggressive about starting to build attractions in that. And they so that was the lab that I, I went to. So this it ended up being kind of a virtual reality, sort of a bubble at the time. There's a lot of excitement about it. People were inventing this new thing, but then they're like, ah, the market's just not really here. It's too early. And I think this is the thing people forget about technologies. They, they assume that a technology either works or it doesn't work. And they don't remember how long it can be between the invention of something and, it, and, the, and the flourishing of the market, right? Like people think of television, when was television invented? People are like, I don't know, 1950, I guess. No, television was invented in the late 1800s. It just didn't work very well. And then people worked on it through the 1910s and the 1920s and the 30s and the 40s. And then finally it was like, oh, okay, now we've got it working well. Um, and virtual reality kind of went through this, has gone through this same path. I mean, look at us right now. We're on, um, you know, we're, we're doing this, you know, video conferencing. When was video conferencing invented? It was invented like 70 years ago. AT&T had it like 70 years ago. And people said, ah, it just wasn't, wasn't quite ready. And then, you know, what did it take? It took 70 years of development in a worldwide pandemic before people would start to use it. So, it, you know, sometimes it takes, people forget how long it can take for a technology to kind of come to fruition. That's beautiful. Wow. So you work for how long did you work at Disney? I was there for seven years um, as a creative director at the virtual reality studio. Um, then came to Carnegie Mellon and started teaching there and also started my own game studio. And I've, I've actually done a lot of work with Disney over the years with my studio. So while I worked there for seven years, I've kind of, you know, worked with them for almost 30 years. That's so nice. So they began their, their, your clients. Yes, uh, that, that was definitely part of what happened since I had a lot of relationships there when I started my own company. Some people said, hey, I, hey, we could use some help. And so I started doing some consulting and then it some of that turned into development work. Um, and so, yeah, they, they definitely were one of our early clients and have, and have been a, a consistent client for us on and off through the years. So what, did, what made you take that leap of faith to start your own business? Like this is one of the mm -hmm. most scariest steps in somebody's life especially if you you know if you have a lot of uh, a lot of education you have a lot of experience getting a high-end job and getting well paid with some sense of security is very easy um and i'm telling you that because that's what happened to me right like i you know i had the corner office i you know i was a senior se senior leadership in multinationals you know managing large development teams and yeah. i gave it all up to start my own career and i'm i'm so happy because that set me free uh, but it was a challenging time where courage was needed. So what was in your mind back then? So I did it, I, in some ways I feel like I cheated. I kind of did it out of necessity. So I had been kind of junior executive at the Disney company, right? I'm this, you know, creative director there who potentially I maybe could have stayed there for a long time and risen up as an executive. And, um, and it was a, it was a pretty well-paying job. And my wife and I decided we wanted to, to leave California and move back to the Northeast. And I had to figure out, well, where am I going to go? Where am I going to be? And I had a connection, uh, through professor Randy Pausch at, um, at Carnegie Mellon. And I knew they'd been running this entertainment technology center there. And I asked, do you need someone to teach game design? And he said, yeah, no, we, we do. Um, and so I, I said, all right, let's do that. So my wife and I moved back to Pittsburgh. So I'm back to Carnegie Mellon again. And I uh, started teaching there, but now I'm going from like junior executive at Disney to assistant professor who's only paid nine months out of the year. And so this is a big drop in pay. And I'm like, oh, if I'm gonna kinda, kinda keep things going, I'm gonna have to get something going on the side. So initially I started my company just so I could do some independent consulting to kinda help you know, help uh, with finances. And so for the first couple of years, it was just me doing consulting and that was going well. And it worked well with me being uh, teaching at the same time. And then some of my clients started to say, hey, if you could pull together a development team, we could throw you some development projects. And I knew some people I really wanted to work with. So I called them up and said, hey, I 
got some potential contracts. Maybe maybe some of us get together, we'll get a little little team going. So we started just that way, kind of doing this contract work, and it went really well. And it, it turned out it was a really good match to be like teaching and having this little company at the same time because um, working with the company and building these things, it made me re more relevant in the teaching space because I, I was kind of very in touch with the market in the real world. And at the same time, the things I was doing at the university gave me a lot of credibility in the business space. One of, one of my uh, heroes this way was Amar Bose, who invented the Bose speaker system. But he did that while he was teaching at MIT and he starts the Bose speaker company. He never quit his professorship at MIT. The whole <laughs> time he did Bose, he was also teaching. And I've done the same thing for like a 20 year period. I kind of built the company up while I was teaching. It's very different now. I was full time back then. And then I kind of had to gradually shed some hours and move to half time. And now for me, it's about a day a week in terms of my involvement there. but. Uh, that was so I was able to do it in a very gradual way where it wasn't I did, it wasn't an all or nothing thing. It's like, well, I'm going to try this supplemental thing. And it kind of grew organically and grew gradually uh, over the years. And that that worked that ended up working very well for me. And that's beautiful because your passion for teaching is to honor that. So you still respect giving back to the community. Uh, and teaching at the university, right? Oh, yeah. No, I mean, to, the, the teaching, I mean, yeah, partly it's an obligation. I feel like it's, it's a sort of a necessary thing to do. But then also, just from a selfish point of view, the, there's, a, there's, a, there's a view from the university that you just don't get to have in industry. Because you don't have, in, in, in industry, you're limited by what can sell. There's no point in making something that isn't going to sell. And so you end up kind of ignoring a lot of things. You're like, that's too risky. We'd never do that. Too risky, too risky, too risky. At the university, it's like, no, we're trying to invent. And like, if it's, let's take risks, let's do some crazy stuff. And so working with the students there, there's this ability to kind of invent and try things and, and, and experiment and envision and, um, and that, that for me, I find it very, it's a very harmonious relationship because some of the vision and insight that I get from the university, I'm able to use in the business world. And then some of the, the kind of real grounding and experience that I get from the business world is very useful in the university context. So I'm, I'm, very, I'm very big on finding ways to kind of bring these two things together. That's beautiful. So how long have you had your business for? About 20 years now. You know, it's such a miracle to say that most businesses go bankrupt within two years. I know. I, I, it is a thing I'm very, very proud of. I mean, there's so many things I'm proud of about this company. Um, we grew very gradually. We've never taken investments is a thing I'm, I'm very, very proud about. We were able to bootstrap and, and, and just kind of keep our own ownership of it. And then further, we've never had a layoff. Um, we've We've been very uh fiscally careful so that we haven't uh, ever gotten in trouble to the point where we needed to to lay people off and so there there are many ways we feel very lucky and very blessed to uh to to be able to you know have this adventure that's that's incredible jesse i mean uh your company is about 200 people right well about 160 is about where we are yeah yeah so it's not small anymore no and the fact that you haven't had to do a layoff in 20 years is I never heard anybody said that in the history of my podcast, and I interviewed a lot of people. <laughs> it's and and uh, like for me, it's it's for me. I look at it as I mean, um, it it it's a choice. Um, there are many companies where they don't. It's not a thing they worry about. They say, "Well, you know what? We're going to try and do this. We're going to we're going to roll the dice and hope it works. And if it works, it works. And if it doesn't, it's well, okay. There'll be some layoffs." And they they just sort of accept that. And we never looked at it that way. We always looked at it as uh, as a more kind of people first point of view. Because one of the things I really believe is that teams grow stronger over time. 
Hmm. And if you end up in a situation where you've got to let some of the team go, like you've weakened the team because not only have you lost people, so you're smaller, but now everyone's scared because like, wow, like maybe I'm next, maybe I'm going to get laid off next. And then further, all those relationships that people have built up working together, well, when someone leaves, like that's all that experience is, is gone. So the more you can kind of keep people together, the more efficiently everybody is. And, yeah. and so um, it, it's just, it is a thing that's good for the company. And so very intentionally, we try and take the position of, we'll risk, when we do a, a venture, when we kind of say, okay, we're gonna create a new game, we'll risk money on it, but we try never to risk jobs on, on a game. And it's, it's a choice that we've made. So you must have a balance now then between uh, recurring revenue and, and contract work, or how's yes. your model working? Yes, no, that's right. We've intentionally, we run the company in a way where we're about 50% contract work and 50% our own, our, our own development, our own IP. Um, when we were, when we were smaller, when we were getting started, we were all contract work and we got good at that and we we liked it and then we kind of saved up our money from that and started to use that to kind of do our own development it was a slow path the first 10 years we did very little of our own development but then as we got bigger it became more and more feasible and then once we started to have more successes it started to work and our goal for, i mean we went for, we went for several years where our goal was can we get to the point where we're so successful where we can do about 50% of our own development and 50% contract work. And we're there. We've been there now for uh, for several years. And it's it feels very comfortable. We, we, we like it a lot because um, it's great to develop your own stuff. And some of that can be very uh, financially successful when it goes well. Um, but it's also great to work with partners. There's projects we've worked on that we never could have done alone. You know, you're working with some, some world-class IPs and world-class partners like you know we, we put a virtual reality game in the Smithsonian you can't do that alone right you you you, you need uh, there, there are things you can only do with partners and so we, we like that balance of having some partner work and some of our own invention and also you expand your knowledge base so in my in my shop uh, I have tried to do that many times and I actually have my own IP on on, on a core product that we used to build IP for somebody else. Um, and what I find when you do contract work is that you enhance your team's knowledge because every client is different and their demands are different and their cultures are different. So we become experts on adapting to their teams, but also experts on learning their technologies if we need to actually implement new technologies. Yes. So now I have this huge knowledge base in my people. We're about 50 people now. and. Uh, and you know it's, it's it's wonderful at the same time it's hard because when a project ends and i have 10 people left hanging i have to fill up the pipeline to get them employed or i have to let them go otherwise the company goes under yes right? <laughs> yes no that's keeping keeping the pipeline full is always a challenge with this this kind of work and that again is one of the reasons it's nice to be able to do some of your own work as well as the contract yeah. work, because you don't have a lot of control over those gaps with the contract work. But if you're ready with internal projects, like, well, I guess, okay, we got we got 15 people who've got nothing to do for the next four months. Okay, let's let's get an internal project going that matches their skill sets and and uh, and and make use of that and have that be uh, an investment. So, so that that we've that's been a. That's been a balance we've liked, and I, I love your point about the uh, when part of one of the great benefits of contract work is, you, yeah, you learn things you never would have learned. And we, we've been able to build a reputation as a company that knows how to take a new technology and figure out how to make it really fun and engaging. And so as a result, we have all these companies come to us and say, look, we just invented this thing. It's not coming out for two years. Can you help us? Can you work with us to like make some experiences for it? And it's great because they're basically paying us to like learn the, you know, what's great about this new technology. And if the technology doesn't work, 
well, okay, we didn't lose anything other than, you know, just our, you know, we got paid and everybody got paid and that's fine. But if that technology is a big success, now we're two years ahead of everybody else because we've been thinking about it and working with it for, for years. And so that, that's been um, a, real, a real plus, I think, is, is um, yeah, the, the, the ability to, to work on, on, on new technologies. Um, uh, but, you know, on, on when someone else is paying for it, that, that, that's a great way to, to do it. You know, uh, Jesse, that talking about new technologies, when when I was building this game, one of the things we had to do is figure out a new game engine because right. the ones that we were using was horrible. Um, so we quickly found out about this new company in town, in town called Unity 3D. <laughs> so we went and negotiated a whole bunch of licenses. I think we were the first big client. And um, we bought 200 licenses from them. And they were just starting up, right? Mm -hmm. And we were reporting the box to them, like we were helping them clean up their engine. And it was beautiful. And at some point, we advised the leadership of this. The company was a big multi-billion dollar company we were building this for. And this, I, I, had, I we advised the, the, the CEO to go into Unity and buy out their company. Because they were that small and they would have been happy to sell, you know. Uh, but he never did. And now look what it is now. <laughs> yeah, no, they 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 definitely had a huge huge success. Right, <laughs> Jesse, what's in the future for you? Uh, okay, in terms of the in terms of the business, um, you know, where we we always kind of take things very uh, organically. I think, you know, in in twenty years running a video game company, I've watched a lot of companies sort of show come and go within that envelope and the thing that i've always observed is usually what leads to the downfall of a game company is when they're too locked in on a particular technology or a particular approach because technologies come and go and if you're all about this one technology and then the wind changes and that's about something else you're in real trouble um and so we've always kind of been able to shift our weight around both with technologies and the things we work on you know we our, our four main lines of business are entertainment games education games health games and theme park and museum projects and we're able to kind of shift our weight around between these right now we're doing a huge amount of virtual reality and augmented reality and it feels like we're going to be doing this for a while because we've been doing it for seven years and it's just growing and, and growing and growing. Feels like it's gonna keep growing. So I think that's gonna be a big part of what we continue to do. But even if that kind of, uh, if the winds shift away from that, you know, we'll be leaning into, well, whatever the next thing is. Already we're looking, you know, one of the big trends in the game industry right now is AI. Everyone's trying to figure out, well, how does AI fit in? to game development and so naturally you know we're trying to be there early and try and understand like okay well where where does this work where does this fit in so um we you know the the mission statement for our company is uh, our mission is to build experiences we're proud of with people we like in order to make the world a better place and so yeah. we, we're our plan is just to kind of keep finding new ways to do that it's funny jesse how you know my, the process to, that, that we use as, as the podcast production company to get people like you, it's incredible because now that you said, you know, what your mission statement is, it's crazy, but the people that reply back to our calling after we found the greatest leaders that we can find, the people that reply back is exactly like you. People with a beautiful heart that wants to share their knowledge because they have something about themselves that they are committed to and is to actually help out their community, help out their country by putting out beautiful stuff. And I thank you for that. And I thank you for, for, for being here, for the calling that you have on this. Because if there were more entrepreneurs like you and I, this country will be a lot different, much better. <laughs> oh, well, thank you, David. And it's wonderful to be able to to be on your show. Your The approach you take on this, it, it it really is special and you know and it means a lot that you invited me here thank you jesse one last question before we finish um if you had access to a billboard oh in, a, in front of a busy highway on earth uh -oh. the busiest highway on earth what would you write in it oh boy 
I think I would write be kind because that seems to be the reminder that people need the most. Beautiful. You know, I'm, I am a man of faith. I'm a born again Christian and the Bible is filled with kindness. Um, you know, when the Lord said, you heard that it's eye for an eye, a cheek for a cheek. Well, now I'm coming to tell you that if somebody hit you in one cheek, you have to turn the other cheek. And that's kindness, right? Um, thank you. If we were a little more kind, more tolerant, I don't like this polarity that we're living in now that if you don't think what I think, you're my enemy. When did that happen? No, it's that's there's right? there's a lot there. The, the uh, We're going through a lot. Uh, right now as a society. I think the interaction between media and the masses is really complicated. And I like, the only way I can kind of get through it is, I like to think we're going through some sort of growing pains in terms of understanding how to relate with each other and how technology affects that. Because we can see that technology and social media has done a tremendous amount to drive us apart. and. Yeah. And I, I hope we can uh, get over that. Um, usually with technologies, we learn. Uh, at first, we make terrible mistakes, and then we learn how to integrate them into our lives in a healthy way. And I like to hope that that'll be one of the trends over the next couple decades is, is understanding, instead of using the technologies to separate from each other, um, to find ways to connect and support each other. And unite us. Beautiful, Jesse. Well, well said. And uh, and you're doing your part. I'm sure I'm trying to do my part, especially with the project we select. We, we have been so successful that we get to choose who we work for. And so we're only taking projects that are pushing the envelope towards unity and kindness, right? Which is beautiful. Yeah, that's Jesse, great. if people would like to find out more about you or apply to get a job at your company or hire you to do their project, where can they find you? Yeah, the easiest thing is to go to shellgames.com um, and you can find all kinds of things about uh, the company. If people are looking to get in touch with me personally, you can go to jessieshell.com and see some things about me and all my contact information is there. Beautiful. Jesse, thank you so much. God bless and have a beautiful rest of the day. All right, thanks. Thanks, David. Cheers. <laughs> That's all for today's episode of the Break Free Podcast. Head on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show. Starting your own business can be tough, but it doesn't have to be. Visit davidmansilla.com to pick up a copy of the number one international best-selling book, Breaking Out of Corporate Jail. Expand what you consider to be possible and reach your full potential. And join us on the next episode. <laughs>